So welcome everyone to the Hartman Institute. Welcome to our rabbis who are here and our fellows studying with us, North American staff, as well as to guests here at the Institute for the Kogod Lecture, one of the few times during our extended summer of program for North American leaders when the Institute is open for the public. And I'm really honored to be with you tonight uh, to speak about this critical topic. I want to start by saying Chag Sameach about July 4th. And I say that not to be glib. The 4th of July is a holiday for the Jewish people. It's oftentimes thought of as a holiday for Americans or for Jewish Americans, Jews who happen to be Americans, but on the principle that one of the most significant pluralities of world Jewry lives under the conditions of America, has thrived deeply in the American condition, which I'll talk about tonight, and that the conditions of America are vital to the survival of not only American Jewry, but arguably world Jewry, I think this is a holiday for the Jewish people. On a personal level, I've spent more July, I did the math before, I've spent more Fourth of Julys in my life here than I have in America. And it's interesting to me that it's always backwards. I wind up celebrating July 4th here and Yom Ha'atzmaut inevitably in America. And, uh, and I guess my experience of Independence Days is always feeling uh, a little bit backwards. And yet I am a fourth generation American. My children are fifth generation Americans, which means that I and my family are more American in terms of our generations than most Israelis are Israelis. And part of what I want to talk about tonight is the experience for American Jews of what it means to call America home, even as the Jewish people tell a story of the arrival in homeland, which is the story of Zionism. I'm here tonight to both celebrate the 4th of July, uh, which I think we celebrate uh, our national holidays independent of our feeling about our countries, uh, and at the same time ask about what American Jews can and must do differently to think about our future as a Jewish community. There are going to be pieces of this that are challenging and maybe a little dark. I had a moment, I'm not going to lie, an hour ago when I just said, let's just keep playing Beyonce and grilling more burgers, which was happening below a little while ago, but such is the Hartman Institute. <laughs> My colleague Shai Zarchi, uh, who works here at the Institute as well as at uh, the Midrashah in Oranim and runs our program for a new generation of Israeli rabbis, tells a wonderful story, a mythic story, about the story of the renewal of Judaism as a project in the state of Israel that has united religious and secular. And the mythic story that he describes, the journey of the Jewish people, is that of a people traveling through the wilderness, through trials and tribulations, arriving at the foot of the mountaintop, having left behind a whole bunch of their luggage before they began the arduous journey since they couldn't travel with them to the promised land or to the new civilization that they were creating. And then upon arriving at the foot of the mountain, realizing that much of the luggage that they had even brought with them would have to remain at the bottom of the mountain in order to engage with the critical project, which would be ascending the mountain and building a viable enough civilization on top of the mountain that would be dragged down by having to carry all of your luggage up the hill. He tells this story uh, in order to illustrate the project of the, the renewal of Judaism in the land of Israel and a, a kind of forgiveness of secular Israelis for having let, left behind the project of Judaism in the building of the state of Israel out of a sense that there was a more urgent project. It's fine that we left our Jewish baggage at the bottom of the mountain when the central activity of the project was building the city on top of the hill. But now that we've succeeded, he describes, about what it means to be a Jewish Israeli, now that we have succeeded and built the society that we mostly want, you start to miss your stuff. You start to realize that we had all of this stuff that we left on the bottom of the mountain that could actually make the home that we live in more beautiful, more purpose-oriented. It could transform a functional society that we have built into an ideal society. And therefore, the story of the renewal of Judaism in Israel, he is, imagines as the Jewish people redescending the mountain, acquiring the stuff that they had carried with them throughout the wilderness, and bringing it back to beautify and transform their homes. The journey in Israel over the past couple of decades has involved the recovery of a thicker cultural national identity than what might have been possible in a moment of existential urgency. Some of the suitcases got left behind in the building of a state of Israel. Some were left at the bottom of the mountain. 
And the story that he tells is one of a kind of profound arrival. You can only go about doing that work once you've actually become safe and realize, broadly speaking, realize that there are things missing. It's also a tool for self-forgiveness, I think, for secular Israelis to say it wasn't that we failed all of this time, it's that we couldn't quite get around to it yet. The story that he tells about Israel, which is a story that I want to try to figure out for American Jewry as well, constitutes one answer to the evolving question that originated for Jews in the middle of the 19th century and was a Jewish question before it was a Nazi question. And that's the question of what's called the Jewish problem. In the 19th century, Jews confronted the problem of recognizing that emancipation had by and large failed to transform the political condition of the Jewish people. It offered a promise that we would be allowed to live as equal citizens in whatever societies we were. It involved profound trades that the Jewish people were willing to make, oftentimes explicitly, about their national loyalties and their sense of belonging in exchange for the right to be equal citizens to belong to the societies that would have them. But that was not the only version of the Jewish problem. That is to say, it wasn't entirely political. It was also a spiritual question. The question many 19th century Jews were asking as a result of the failure of emancipation was not just what must we do in order to construct a new political reality for the Jewish people, but I think a much bigger one, which was what makes us us besides being themed by them? <laughs> right? The problem of how do we characterize what it means to be Jewish outside of the framework of simply having our Jewishness, our political identity defined by the actions of others. Not all of the theorists and activists who worked on solving the Jewish problem, which by and large picks up throughout the 19th and, and especially 20th century and transforms itself into political action to construct the Jewish state, not all of the activists and thinkers about how to respond to this Jewish problem were convinced that political solutions would solve the Jewish problem. We have a history of thinkers who fought against the idea that what Jews simply needed to do was to come up with better political solutions like that of sovereignty. And Chad Ha'am, Chad Ha'am at the First Zionist Congress in 1897 gets up and says that the secret of the Jewish people's persistence is that it learned at a young age not to worship material power but only spiritual power warns the members of the First Zionist Congress that if the Jewish people devote all of their energy towards the building of a secular nation state, they will solve one political problem but endure the Jewish problem indefinitely, normalizing the condition of the Jewish people like any other state and ending the story of the Jewish people as exceptional. He loses, by and large. The reason you need a Shaizarchi in 2019 is in part because the prophetic voices like those of Achad Am largely get ignored. Franz Rosenzweig in the early 1920s makes a similar prophetic argument, saying to German Jews that the central project since emancipation has been emancipation, that Jews have lost track of what it means to do Jewish beyond what it means to pursue political autonomy and independence, and he says quite harshly, that Zionism serves more effectively as a diagnostician and maybe even a pathologist of the Jewish condition than it does as a healer. It diagnoses that the Jewish problem is, in, is political. When it decides that the only solution to the Jewish problem is political, it may be a pathologist of the Jewish condition and argues famously that what the Jewish people need is not just political solutions to our challenges, but religious, spiritual, and in his case, uh, study solutions as well. Hannah Arendt makes a similar warning of Jews in the 1940s, arguing that the characteristics of a downtrodden people can only be their values, Martin Buber, Isaac Deutscher. These are not just losing positions that we dispense into history and say, since they also had politics that wind up losing out, the arguments that they were making must therefore be uh, not valuable. That would be the way to, to avoid taking the larger dissent seriously and missing one of the opportunities that presents itself most profoundly to the Jewish people in the conditions of the 21st century to listen to the prophetic warnings they were suggesting and ask whether if it wasn't possible in the 20th century to respond to them, it might be possible and even urgent in the 21st 
to do exactly that. I want to suggest tonight that American Jews need a version of Shai Zarchi's story for ourselves as well. My contention, which I want to play out tonight, is that politics has become the dominant discourse of American Judaism. Not just the dominant thing that American Jews talk about, that's probably true of people the world over, but that politics has become the dominant discourse of the Judaism itself. This is our proposed solution, so to speak, to the Jewish problem, to become even more political in pursuit of political solutions to the conditions that we face. And as we were warned before by Arendt and Buber and Deutscher and Rosenzweig and most early Achad Ha'am, we may as American Jews be missing the chance to do something remarkable as a Jewish community living in such unprecedented conditions. Here's the great irony. The less a Jewish community actually needs to litigate the question of emancipation, the more it seems that Jews are obsessed with it. As background about what has happened in the American Jewish community over the last couple of generations, what positions us for the opportunity to address this question and what helps us understand the way politics has become the dominant discourse of Judaism, I want to argue that American Jews have been undergoing a rapid series of changes in American Jewish life that we have made a category error about, a series of changes that are actually revolutionary that American Jews by and large have treated as evolutionary. American Judaism has been in the process of massive changes along three indexes in our identity, ideology, and infrastructure. It's in the evening, alliteration helps. Identity, ideology, and infrastructure and that for very legitimate reasons, American Jews have processed these changes as being evolutionary changes rather than revolutionary changes. The primary reason we've done this as American Jews is maybe a defense mechanism. Jews are not really used to pace of change being fast. We are skeptical in a Talmudic and biblical tradition that when people come along and say things need to change quickly, we are skeptical that they are rupturing that nice covenant between tradition and change that enables people to live through change and not feel a sense of whiplash. And so we pretend as though these change are actually slow when they are rapid. But there's another reason why I think we are in some ways allergic as American Jews to recognizing quite how dramatically and quite how, di how differently the American Jewish community is changing is because we learned in the 20th century that Judaism can change fast. It can change fast when we experience massive geopolitical events. Take any Jewish library. After the Holocaust, we know that Judaism is allowed to change. We're allowed to build entire bookshelves that are filled with books, treating the problem of what it means to have post-Holocaust theology. It's almost nonsense to say that Judaism is the same before the Shoah as it is after the Shoah. Something radical has happened, and therefore Judaism is allowed to change. The creation of the State of Israel does the same thing. It's ludicrous to say that Judaism is the same after the creation of the State of Israel as it was prior to the creation of the State of Israel. And so we have full shelves in our libraries with a new, a new canonical piece of Jewish literature called Zionism. So it's not true that Judaism can change quickly and that we can't process change, but American Jews may have learned the lesson that the only time that you're allowed to talk about rapid change is when you experience a massive geopolitical event. And of course, the great irony of the American Jewish experience is that right now, the American Jewish community is the Jewish community in the world with the greatest sense of continuity <laughs> from several generations before. It's a great irony for a community fixated on continuity to think about how radically continuous the American Jewish story has been. And because the American Jewish story has been radically continuous, it has embedded, I think, in American Jews a skepticism of believing that the changes underway in American Jewish life are quite as revolutionary as they have been. We are on relatively uncharted grounds in Jewish history to witness a creative project in the remaking of Judaism borne out by possibly the best conditions that a Jewish community has ever experienced, and that includes those that are sovereign and those that are diasporic. Ident in, the, in the sphere of Jewish identity, 
The simple change that has undergone the American Jewish community over two generations is the transformation from once upon a time. American Jews, and perhaps more importantly, American non-Jews, knew that there was a distinction between Jew and non-Jew and could recognize it. Increasingly, in most sectors of American Jewish life, there is no obvious, no intuitive distinction between Jew and non-Jew. There are very few social or political consequences to being a Jew. We see this from the fact that president, three presidential candidates in 2016, the three finalists, so to speak, all have Jewish grandchildren, and as a result, Jewishness does not become litigated as a feature of the 2016 presidential election. That's actually remarkable in Jewish history. The processes of conversion, adoption, assimilation, intermarriage, whatever terms you want to use, signify a radical ethnic revolution that American Jews have been in, where by and large, both Jews are increasingly uninterested in ethnicity characterizing the distinction between Jew and non-Jew, and non-Jews are equally uninterested in most metropolitan areas in policing the distinction between Jew and non-Jew. Even as, even as recently as the 60s and 70s, Jewish comedy, Jewish writing, non-Jewish representation of Jews in the public square assumed that there was a fundamental difference between the Jew and the non-Jew, even if they could only describe it in, in, uh, in culturally familiar terms, that story no longer seems to hold sway. In the realm of ideology, once upon a time we might have said about the American Jewish community that even though people do different things, adhere to different denominations, observe Judaism or don't, that by and large we might be able to construct some notion of a common Judaism held by the majority of Jews, that those who knew that they were disputing that common Judaism could self-identify as being minorities some shared sense of principles, call it of the silent majority of American Jewry, that constituted a shared common ideology of American Judaism. In the middle of the 20th century, we have terms for this invented like Jewish peoplehood, broad support for Israel, for Zionism, broad commitment to patronizing institutions, to belonging to synagogues, that there was a common Judaism that didn't mean necessarily that Jews held to similar beliefs or axioms, but participated in some broad sense in being in community and in coalition with one another. There is no common Judaism anymore for the majority of American Jews. In fact, all of those items that were listed previously as constituting the stuff of common Judaism for Jews in the 20th century are now the issues around which Jews are more likely to fight than any other. Remember that great story that Jews used to tell of Jews don't air our dirty laundry in public? Public square for American Jews is a laundromat. That is where American Jews litigate our distinctions and it signifies, it betrays the knowledge that there is not just not a common Judaism, but that what we consider common is profoundly contested. And the third great rev revolution in Jewish life has been the institutional revolution. I alluded to this uh, yesterday when I was with our rabbis. A couple of examples. The institutional infrastructure built by American Jews in the middle of the 20th century still endures, but mostly for technical reasons, like endowments. It doesn't endure as the institutional infrastructure for a community's actual needs. 40% of conservative synagogues have shut in America in the past 30 years. There's a radical remaking of the Jewish philanthropic map. We knew this back in the 80s. Already back in the 1980s, there was more money located in Jewish family foundations than there was in the federation system for the first time since the federation system had been created 70 years earlier. In other words, Jews are actually constructing a totally different set of institutions that speak more to the needs of a 21st century Jewish community, even as we have inherited the whole infrastructure of a 20th century Jewish community. In some cases, that infrastructure is dying quickly and responsibly. In other cases, it lingers and interferes with the business of building radically new institutions. On all three fronts, however, these are not minor changes. These are not minor shifts 
that once upon a time there was a distinction between the Jew and the non-Jew in America that everybody knew, and everybody was committed to preserving, and now it doesn't exist anymore. Right? That's the identity revolution. In the New York Jewish population study in 2012, one out of 20 self-reporting Jews, people who characterized themselves as Jews, had no Jewish parents and didn't convert. A term that forces sociologists to come up with a new category of the Jew, which is voluntary affiliational identity. I have decided to affiliate as a Jew, and there's no way for anybody to stop me. <laughs> and as easy as it is to cross the boundary into the Jewish people, it is equally easy to cross the boundary out of the Jewish people. And in most cases, most American Jews don't know that there is a boundary. Jewishness is a cultural identity as part of hybrid identities that are a feature of what it means to be in the 21st century. And so why would I care about policing the boundary? Identity revolution, the ideological revolution of the decline of a common Judaism, and the institutional revolution. And even so, under these conditions, it forces us to ask then, what is the discourse, dominant discourse of what American Judaism is about? And I would suggest that you can oftentimes discern a community's values from its controversies and the attendance at its major conferences. Pay attention to the controversies and it'll tell you that which people get angry about is usually a tell of what they care about. If you rewind back two years to the summer of 2017, something amazing happened. When all three major denominations in America, Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox, were embroiled in controversies, but none were theological. <laughs> none were about community. All of them were about politics. The Reform Movement was reeling from a commencement address given by Michael Chabon in, at HUC in the spring of 2017, in which he used his platform as the commencement speaker to talk about the problem of boundaries in Jewish life and focusing on the occupation and the crises, imminent crisis at the border. In the conservative movement, the, the, or the small organization, if not now, was protesting the Camp Ramah system for what it perceived as improperly censoring education about the Israeli occupation. And in the Orthodox community, the Orthodox Union had given an award, its Tzedek Tzedek Tirdov Award, to Jeff Sessions on the day at which I believe the travel ban took, took effect. And they were forced to rescind the award to Jeff Sessions in light of tremendous political pushback by members of their base and the press. In other words, three denominations who ostensibly originated in, the, in different ideological beliefs about Judaism, theological claims, halachic claims, and moral claims, were savaged and roiled by entirely a set of political controversies. The story I'm trying to tell tonight is that the dominant values of American Judaism are entirely in the theater of the political. There are an extraordinary set of consequences that are taking place as a result of Judaism becoming entirely political. I want to share with you what I think some of those consequences are and then offer some directions for where I think American Judaism has to go, which is going to require a collective effort. Here are a few consequences of when Judaism becomes entirely a political discourse. For Jewish professionals, for rabbis, for anyone working in the Jewish community, Judaism becoming entirely political is actually an existential concern and a matter of survival. Ask most rabbis in the American Jewish community, you could roast a pig on Yom Kippur on the shul lawn and it would lead to some committee discussions. If you say the wrong thing about Israel or about American politics, you compromise your job and you incentivize an enormous amount of anger. It's unsafe for Jewish professionals right now to lead their institutions. A conversation we've tried to cultivate in the American Jewish community through the Hartman Institute over the last couple of years under the auspices of something we've called the Courageous Leadership Project. How do you make sure that rabbis and Jewish professionals, the very people you want in these positions of leadership because they know how to take care of things with nuance and with passion, how do you make sure that they are not driven from their positions and replaced by people who are very good at being politicians, but potentially very bad at being rabbis? 
This is enormous challenge. It is not fully spoken about. And there are a whole set of reinforcing elements of the American Jewish influence economy that are making this so difficult. Philanthropic power, the relationship of the state of Israel to the organized Jewish community in America, and et cetera. This is a consequence merely. There are many factors to this. It's also very hard to be on social media. That's a piece of this. Uh, the news cycle changes fast. But the dominant reason this has happened is because what it means to be a Jew in America is to be a political actor and a political guide. Most of our rabbis, Jewish educators, and Jewish professionals are blessedly not trained to be politicians. They are not taught, uh, as my colleague Phil Grobard, rabbi in San Diego, wrote a few years ago, they're not taught in rabbinical school to know the number of Iranian centrifuges. It's not supposed to be a part of rabbinic education, but it has become an essential criteria for the evaluation of rabbinic leadership. A second consequence for the American Jewish community is the inevitability of bifurcation. In a political climate, there are become, on virtually any issues, two positions, one that you're supposed to take and one on which the people who inhabit the other side are not just fundamentally wrong, but your moral enemies. The, the, in, for the Jewish community in America, we have seen the transformation of the Jewish significant other for most American Jews from their fellow Jew to their political allies. That's your significant other. That's the person you're going to war with. That's the person who you consider fundamentally morally legitimate. This remakes the map of who are the good Jews and who are the bad Jews as measured both by Jews and by non-Jews. This is an unbelievable thing. A couple of years ago, a non-Jewish congressman meeting with a group of J Street students castigated them. This is a non-Jewish congressman meeting with J Street students, castigated them for being bad Jews and self-hating because of the position that they took on uh, Israeli policy. This is a remaking of the map of who, who constitutes what it means to be in the Jewish community, who are our key relationships or who are our allies, or last summer, when the activist Linda Sarsour began an activist fundraising campaign on social media to try to take down the forward because of what she perceived to have been biased coverage against the Jewish left. So it's not just Jews r r staking out a series of positions in our own community against fellow Jews on the basis primarily of political positions. It's also non-Jews perceiving opportunity to remake the map of who constitutes a good Jew you are a better Jew, for instance, if you are an evangelical that supports Israel than a non-supportive of Israel Jew who, I don't know, davens three times a day. That remakes the map of who is a Jew and who are our significant allies. And in some ways, these examples are not wrong. If Jewish political identity in America is the thickest and most consequential expression of Jewish identity, then having the right politics might be an expression of Judaism as a legitimate tool for boundary setting, and by extension, as we've seen, even the partisanization of anti-Semitism. Right? If ultimately we as a Jewish community decide that politics is what Judaism is about, we should not be surprised that Jews want to use that as the measure of deciding who are our friends and who are our enemies. And we should definitely not be surprised that non-Jews pay attention to that also and use that as a means of establishing relationships with and against the Jewish community. And perhaps the most damning concern that I have, and one in which the enlisting the help of rabbis is critical, is that the politicization of Jewishness in America results in the deep thinning out of Jewish identity. If what it means to be a good Jew is fundamentally to have the right politics, I ultimately don't really need Judaism. A prominent American rabbi said to me uh, about a year ago, I'm not sure why my rabbinic conference, in her case this was the story of the um, reform biennial, I'm not sure why there is no boundary, no differentiation between the agenda of the reform biennial and the Democratic National Convention. Over time, if there's no gray space between expressions of Jewish politics and expressions of Jewish religion, religion becomes irrelevant. 
why not actually find the larger platforms, the larger levers to pursue your political identity within a society than try to do so through false frames attached from a religious tradition atop a political platform. And the same grievance can be argued uh, on the right side as well. The thinning out of Jewish identity is manifest in a whole bunch of different sites. There has been a rapid, precipitous decline in Jewish philanthropy towards Jewish cultural institutions. The Jewish museum movement is suffering enormously. Most of the fellowships that existed in the Jewish community for the production of Jewish culture and art have disappeared. And on top of the fact that the American Jewish community is notoriously like America, and perhaps proudly monolingual, we are, as Americans, of people that proudly cheers of our ignorance <laughs> of being the people in the world that know the least amount of languages, <laughs> mostly because Americans like America, and by extension, the language that it speaks, the idea that you would both thin out Jewish identity and not have an actual set of languages and cultural voc vocabulary with which to speak Jewishness portends very poorly for the ability to resolve this problem. Even such a thing as the security of our institutions, which I know has become a huge concern for American Jews in the past year since Pittsburgh and Poway, obviously security is something to be taken seriously, but we watch cautiously as the security of Jewish institutions becomes a fixation. It becomes an ideology, a dogma. Another rabbi said to me a few months ago, most of the time in my rabbinate, I was able to talk to people about, I don't know, pastoral things. For the last three months, the only thing my congregation wants to talk to me about are ballistic windows. This is not only bad for Jewish security because it starts to miss the broader context in which the discourse on security for Jews is taking place, but it's undoubtedly bad for Judaism. <laughs> If the primary activity of Jewish leaders is to respond to an evolving political climate by both becoming political and becoming fixated on our security in that political climate, what happens to the Judaism that these institutions were meant to cultivate? And here's the wacky thing. It used to be that progressives and liberals in the American Jewish community used to, to, used to resist the over, this is not a word, lacrimosization of the American Jewish experience. Liberals used to resist this. I remember even 20 years ago, 10 years ago, there was this rising sense among liberal Jews that the Holocaust is not a sufficient anchor of Jewish identity. There was a term that appeared, a horrible term actually, that appeared in Jewish education called Holocaust fatigue. The conviction that if we are primarily about safety, survival, and, and preventing the Holocaust from happening, we were going to lose the next generation of Jews who were not going to be convinced by that as a sufficient anchor, a sufficient reason to be Jewish. Even for some of the theologians, Emil Fackenheim, Yitz Greenberg, who were fixated on the Holocaust transforming what it meant to be a Jew, they did so conditionally. The fact that the Holocaust was central for the remaking of the modern Jewish experience was supposed to give way to the idea that after the Holocaust, we are obligated to rebuild the covenant. For Greenberg, it was covenantalism, a third covenant, a voluntary one for the Jewish people and God. For Fackenheim, it was tikkun olam. How do we transform the story of victimhood into the story of thriving for something that transcends victimhood? For David Hartman, it was a very clear message that Jewish people must stop using Auschwitz as the organizing principle for Jewishness and instead must use the covenant at Sinai. And watch what it, watching what has happened, if that was what liberal and progressive Jews used to say 20 or 30 years ago, liberal and progressive Jews are now way out in front on anti-Semitism, on the fight against anti-Semitism, on the victimhood and collective consciousness story of the Jewish people because partly, that's what is in vogue to be Jewish, and partly because it helps build political allyship with other people perceived to be victims and vulnerable. Lost in the American Jewish conversation, which has been taking place over the last couple of weeks, about Holocaust analogies. When can we draw comparisons between the Holocaust and uh, other stories that are taking place in our time? Um, Lost in these analogies are why the, why the Holocaust and the creation of the State of Israel remain the story that anchor and describe what it means to be a Jew in America. 
Must it be that way? That the only way in which we litigate our questions as Americans and as Jews is in reference to these defining rupture elements in recent Jewish history, which we know shaped our experience, but now continue to pull us back into anchoring political and existential stories. I suggest that I think that part of the reason this has happened is because American Jews have not done the alternative work not really done the work to figure out what would an American Judaism look like that wasn't defined entirely by politics and anchored so much by recent history. So I want to offer three approaches for tonight and then open up for your suggestions, questions, comments, pushback, and maybe ideas for how, these, how this might be actualized. I think there are three central needs that American Judaism has if it's going to address the Jewish problem as something that is more than political and is actually deeply existential. The first is American Jews actually need some political solutions. That is to say, recognize that this is the condition and try to survive in it. If this is the state of affairs for rabbis, for Jewish communal professionals, for Hillel directors, who are the ones who are victimized most by this climate, then we as a Jewish community need to be providing many more tools, skills, networks for, um, to, to enable Jewish professionals to survive and thrive in this system. Tools, skills, and networks that are content-based help people to figure out how to withstand an assault on their legitimacy, right? why to withstand an assault on their legitimacy as leaders, and in some ways just protective. We've noticed that when rabbis who are connected in our network have come under attack because they have bad politics. And it's unbelievably easy for Jewish leaders to come under attack because they have bad politics. It happens oftentimes in shadowy ways on the internet. The, the strongest uh, tool that they have reported that has helped them to withstand those challenges has been a strong network of character witnesses, other rabbis who have stood up to tell people this person is okay. So one set of tools and interventions for a community that is fixated with politics are to not try to fight it, but to figure out what might be the remedies, what might be the tools to enable Jewish leaders to survive in that climate. That is a concession, so to speak. Instead of fighting it, at least trying to protect ourselves from its damages. The second approach, however, is a massive project. American Jews need a project of massive Jewish cultural renewal in America. Not as an escape from politics, but one that actually recognizes that profound production of Jewish culture always lives in relationship to politics. American Jews need a Yesh Atid revolution, but maybe one that lasts more than one Knesset cycle. <laughs> the Yesh Atid revolution was a, a, a moment in the history of the Jewish problem. It was when Israelis politically said, the reason we have built this society is not merely to elect politicians who protect us, but to elect politicians who build a better society for us. It doesn't last, it, no solution to the Jewish problem that tries to avoid politics, security, and safety can last very long unless it also figures out how to talk the language of politics, security, and safety. Part of the reason the Yesh Atid revolution lasts for too short of time is because it understood these moments to be in tension with each other rather than dialogue with it. I think American Jews need a cultural renewal project that doesn't avoid politics but engages it or lives compatibly with it, a cultural renewal project that enriches Judaism rather than escaping politics. I'm not convinced that American Jewish cultural renewal has to be in Hebrew. I know I have people who disagree with me on this in this room. I'm happy to hear from them. I don't think it has to be in Hebrew. I don't think most cultural projects that diaspora Jewish communities did throughout history were necessarily in Hebrew. They were in languages, in idioms, literally and figuratively, in which diaspora Jews understood who they were in the world and tried to articulate values and rationales accordingly. There are not that many great theoretical American Jewish books. One colleague of mine writes that the last great American Jewish book written about American Judaism may have been Kaplan, Judaism as a Civilization. Maybe. I would say there have been a few others. There have, of course, been American Jewish novels, but many American Jewish novels are stories of Jewish decline, 
They are stories of the atrophying of the Jewish condition. But there is a need for profound cultural production by American Jews as an act of resistance and as an act of claiming that Jewish cultural identity, religious identity, spiritual identity are as essential answers to the Jewish problem as politics are. And the third piece is that American Judaism is going to have to figure out a theology of itself that is non-binary as relates to the state of Israel. It's not two options here where you can either be a Zionist and therefore the totality of American Jewish identity is defined by a relationship to Israel, or you have to stand and demonstrate yourself as an anti-Zionist in which the totality of your Jewish identity is defined by the state of Israel. In both cases, the obsession with Zionism and the obsession with anti-Zionism actually demonstrate an inability to articulate some notion of what it means to be an American Jew, a diaspora Jew, in a cultural thriving condition that is not just not the state of Israel. American Jewry has thrived in America because it has managed implicitly to align the stories that it tells about America with the stories that it tells about what Jewish values are, and yet remarkably, I would suggest most American Jews can't fully tell that story about themselves. A great example to this effect is that if you Google the phrase Jewish and democratic, you can try this at home, all of the hits you're going to get are going to be about Israel as a Jewish democratic state, even though the project of aligning Jewish values to democratic values has been an American Jewish project much longer than it has been the project of a Jewish nation state. We American Jews are defined by our attempts to live in relationship between Jewish values and democratic values, but there is virtually no theoretical literature on the question, and there is certainly no ideological notion that to be an American Jew means you have to be thinking about your Jewishness and your democracy all the time. This ideology would suggest that we need a stronger conceptual frame which says that American Jewry is not just a diaspora. When we, imagine, when we use the term diaspora, we imagine that there's a binary in the world. It's not as bad as the great original Jewish binary which divides the world between two categories of people, Jews and non-Jews, which makes no sense statistically. But it is an equally flawed binary to imagine that there's nothing particular Nothing unusual, nothing remarkable about America. It is just the story of continuity of diaspora, just as there have been diasporas before. When American Jewry doesn't do the work of differentiating America as something different than diaspora, what it says to itself, I think secretly on our own heads, is America is a diaspora that will end like all other diasporas. When you do that, you become prophets of your own demise in conditions that do not seem to indicate that American Jews are on the verge of such a decline. To do so, for American Jews to articulate an identity, not on the other side of a binary from Israel, but as a means of self-respect, does not constitute an act of distancing from Israel. It actually has the potential for American Jews to help us organize our identities in relationship to Israel. It is only a group that is not sure about who it is where it is that has so many messy attitudes towards those Jews over there. I would suggest that actually if American Jews had a better understanding of who we were as American Jews, it would strengthen the nature of our relationship with Israel rather than undermining it. All of what I've said tonight emanates from, as I said, some of the most remarkable conditions in Jewish history. The problems that American Jews have are luxury problems. They are problems borne by conditions that most, almost every Jew in Jewish history would have envied. They are problems of a community that has been made to feel comfortable in a country to the point that they are made to feel like hosts rather than guests the people in a country who feel that they are owners, proprietary of a public square, right, and therefore responsible for that society rather than seeing themselves as only conditional tenants. These are good problems. I would not trade these problems for most of the problems of diaspora's past, which were about existential survival. But it is precisely because the problems of American Jewry are not problems of political and existential survival that it is profoundly urgent for the agenda of American Jewry to shift from fixation on political and existential survival to something more transcendent. 
American Jews, I would say, have thrived at making America the land of the Jewish free, I think the next big challenge is to make it equally the home of the Jewish brave. Thank you. I'm not sure if there's, there may be a microphone here and there, but I'm happy to take some uh, questions, responses. Go ahead. If you're able to. I feel went from Bible, Holocaust, Israel, and I feel like um, a lot of my oh, a lot of my peers uh, have a bit of a thinner Judaism uh, because it was uh, lived vicariously through Israel. And I I wonder if uh, a lot of what I was hearing in in your lecture, and I wonder if this is what you meant, was just is less Zionism. Is it that we need less? less Zionism and less focus uh, on, on the state of Israel and more focus at home. Great. So mm, that just changed, right? Uh, I guess what I'm trying to talk about is not necessarily less Israel, more Israel, but what I would call contextual Israel. I think you're probably right. Uh, for most American Jews who have a relatively thin Jewish education, and if Israel winds up taking up a huge piece of that Jewish education, it creates all sorts of challenges down the line. One of the challenges which we know and experience is that people encounter a different Israel than the one that they're educated to. That's one set of challenges. And another is it may not be sufficient for a Jew to know that there's a profoundly interesting project taking place 7,000 miles away as a sufficient anchor for their own Jewish identity. What's interesting about the way you asked the question, though, is you said Bible, Holocaust, Israel. Is, this is an amazing thing. The great knock that Israelis have had on their own educational system about Jewish education was identical. It was Tanakh to Palmach, right? I learned Bible. That gave me a kind of anchoring in some archaeological, historical, contextual relationship to the land of Israel, and then I jump to the history of modern Israel. And that goes back to what I said at the outset in terms of the Shizarchi example, where Judaism is now flourishing and cultural renewal is flourishing in Israel is exactly the plugging in of those missing pieces. You have a massive piyut movement. Who would have thought that medieval poetry would be making such a comeback? And it's happening through all sorts of contemporary and modern expressions that reflect a claiming of this whole Jewish cultural lineage. So yes, if that was your Jewish education, we need to fill in that gap between Bible, Holocaust, and Israel. And I don't think it means it comes at the cost of a relationship to the modern state of Israel. I think the modern state of Israel makes a lot more sense if you understand all of the history of Jewish cultural flourishing. I would say, though, one of the things that has to happen in relationship to that is not just studying the history of Jewish culture and Jewish ideas and the Jewish moral disposition, right, Talmud, all of that. It has to happen in a way that invites the the contemporary person to realize that they have opportunity to be contributors to Jewish culture and not merely recipients. I think this is one of the most damaging components of Tanakh to Palmach in Israel was you're going to read the Bible, it's going to anchor the reason why you're here, but what is going to define your life is a relationship to the modern state through the Palmach story. When you create a renaissance of Jewish culture and ideas, it can't help but incentivize individuals to believe that they can be participants in Jewish culture, active creators of a story rather than simply passive recipients. And here, here also, this is a place where Israel can actually be amplified as a feature of Jewish identity. Part of what goes wrong in the teaching of Israel to American Jews is that American Jews overwhelmingly learn the history of Israel, or they learn contemporary things about Israel that their teachers think they will find uh, exciting. What they tend not to learn about Israel is this story of cultural vitality and renewal, partly because it's very hard for American Jews to access it. If you don't know, if you can't understand the music on the radio, you don't understand quite how Jewish it is. Um, and that's simply a linguistic problem. But it's such a weird missed opportunity. If we want 
our young people to be in relationship to Israel as something more than political, it makes no sense for us to be inducting them primarily into a political conversation. Yes. I'll go ahead right here, because then we can pass the microphone back to the back. Um, I wanted to ask about your, your comment that anti-Semitism has been taken on by the progressive, progressive and left. Um, it's not something that I've observed, but that's interesting. And I might suggest two reasons what it would be common on. One is that that is only one area where Jews can um, stick together across political lines. And it's troubling that that is one of the few areas, but it does seem to be. Um, the other reason is that I think on the left, it is a way for the Jewish progressives to play their um, connection with other progressives, that a sensitivity, yes, we are also minorities, you know, to connect with that. So I think, um, I'd like your comments on that, but also the question of how does the whole American context, non-Jewish American context, yeah. that affect all of this? So, so um, I wish it were the case, as you said uh, at the outset, that uh, anti-Semitism could still be the thing that organizes us as American Jews. I think those of us living in the story have already recognized that barn doors open on that one. Uh, anti-Semitism, which should be the last vestige of Jewish collective identity, has become the totally partisan discourse. You see that happening. I, I felt like this, the great moment of, disc of, of like, here we are, was watching two uh, non-Jewish congresswomen arguing about the legitimacy of Holocaust analogies. And I was like, who am I in this story exactly? Um, and, I'm, and what's worse is watching the way that they are embraced and cheered on by Jews because it is seen as an act of allyship. That just feels, that's short-term thinking, right? Because what ultimately happens is Jewish allies to a non-Jewish congressperson who has been endorsed by sectors of the Jewish community as the legitimate arbiter of, uh, of anti-Semitism, those Jews resisting it look like self-hating Jews to a huge percentage uh, of the American public, and there's no better pathway to, um, to the proliferation of anti-Semitism than when, when the larger population believes that it is capable of litigating who is a good Jew and who is a bad Jew. I think that story is now, um, that story is now done. I wish it was otherwise. I have felt like it's like watching a slow-moving car crash and watching American Jews embracing, running into it, and I, I, in essence, don't blame them because it's exciting to be in a society where non-Jews seem very happy to be your allies, um, even though I think this is just kind of one of the great characteristics of Jewish peoplehood is some underlying notion that at the end of the day, we are better friends to ourselves than others are to us. Um, so I don't, think that's the, I don't think that's the story anymore. Uh, and the reason I mentioned progressives and liberals is because I think, I think there is a broad recognition when we are in a time in which anti-Semitism is rising uh, of folks on the left that they are not willing, and I think they're right, to allow anti-Semitism as a conversation and as a commitment to be owned by people with politically conservative beliefs. I think they legitimately, and they are correct about this, are quite anxious that what that's gonna produce are bad politics that not only exacerbate that anti-Semitism, but ultimately that close off the possibility of the kinds of alliances that would be good for Jews in America. <laughs> so if I want to survive as a Jew in America, the, left ar the argument of the left is the most effective way to do that is to juxtapose anti-Semitism together with Islamophobia and other forms of structural and systemic um, oppressions, and by doing so to build a broad base uh, of coalitions. But again, that's, the fact that it's contested tells an unbelievable story about American Jewish thriving and at homeness and one that's not actually, I think, all that good. Um, Joe in the back and then we'll come back one for them. Um, thank you so much for the presentation uh, and for the little shout out about Hebrew. So yeah. the question, so you begin by talking about the sort of perverse pride that we take as Americans in our, in our uh, monolingualism. <laughs> and, and conclude with a kind of a lament and a, and a, and a hope for a, a revitalization of Jewish culture. But there's obviously, in America, but there's obviously a connection 
between um, uh, our literacy in other Jewish languages, not only Hebrew, but in, in Yiddish or Judeo-Arabic or Ladino, whatever it may have you, and our lack of cultural vitality, um, which has led me personally, obviously, to embrace the Hebrew root, yeah. although that's hardly the only other root. But what is, what is your thought about uh, the future of Jewish languages in America or whether there's a possibility of some sort of cultural renaissance without a turn toward, toward Jewish language? Yeah. <sighs> If you could flip a switch and uh, world Jewry could speak one shared language, I think that would be great. You can't flip a switch. Uh, American Jews, I think, again, because of their Americanness, are convinced that they can't learn Hebrew. I, I, don't I don't think that's true. I mean, people learn Mandarin Chinese and fencing and et cetera. Um, French horn. Uh, there's no reason American Jews couldn't learn Hebrew, but it, it simply hasn't been so, it hasn't, it hasn't, American Jews aren't convinced that there's something wrong and that they need it. Now, even if you were able to convince that American, American Jews that there was something wrong, uh, and I don't think generally selling something to a people should emanate from a sense of being something wrong or that you're missing out, I don't think that's sufficient to get somebody to, to commit to a project like this. I think that there is something about culture that is more kind of deeply anthropological about the human condition that I could imagine producing Jewish culture without having to without having to make that transition. And what I fear about the emphasis on Hebrew is that it sets up a obstacle towards the construction and production of Jewish culture that's not necessary. I also don't think it's actually been historically true. I think Jews and diasporas produced forms of Jewish culture that either weren't totally in Hebrew or sometimes um, not in Hebrew at all. Uh, and I think that we have to figure out how to make those forms of culture authentic. I think post the creation of the State of Israel, the more we fixate on Hebrew, we also implicitly send the message that it is only the stuff coming out of Zion that is authentic. And part of the activity of an American Jewish culture is being comfortable with the idea that you can do unbelievable things in the English language. It's like um, Robert Alter's translation of the Bible. There's two ways to evaluate it. Is it a good translation of the Hebrew? Hebraists probably have opinions. Is it a remarkable moment for English-speaking Jews? Yes, <laughs> independent of whether it's actually a good translation of Hebrew because it's gonna be the means through which many Americans and among them Jews are gonna engage the biblical tradition in ways they hadn't before. Uh, there's a guy in Los Angeles, Aaron Henney, who's doing really interesting things. One of them, he's a playwright and, uh, and a performer, and he took a, it's totally weird, Greco-Roman Jewish apocryphal book um, called the Exagogue, which is a, a Greco-Roman transformation of the Exodus story into Hellenistic values, and he's actually staging it. <laughs> and I find that to be unbelievable, because it's both a, act of producing new Jewish culture, it is a rehabilitation of old models of Jewish culture, and it is an act of acknowledging that when Jews do new Jewish culture, they're doing something that's old and deeply authentic. So I just, it's not that I'm anti-Hebrew. Hebrew's great. Um, there's a lot of great Jewish culture available to, in Hebrew, but there is also the possibility of cultural production for American Jews, and if part of what I'm trying to get at is an American Jewish self-confidence, I think American Jews are gonna have to believe that there are authentic ways for them to be cultural producers in the language that they already speak. Um, yeah, go ahead, Daniel. I'll add my thanks for the presentation. Um, I spent this year uh, our congregation held services in a local Presbyterian church while we were undergoing remodel. And the experience of the year was one for our community where they learned a tremendous amount about themselves and about Judaism um, while through living in proximity and sharing yeah. their Judaism with the, um, with the Christian community. That part of that was made possible because the pastor Im explicitly said that this hosting of us was not about conversion, that this hosting of us was an act of generosity um, and even acknowledging uh, some of the wrongs that Christians had committed against the Jewish community throughout history. 
So I mention this because I wonder if part of that Jewish cultural production um, can be, can actually take place through interfaith relations that are not merely seen as instrumentation for um, you know, preparing yourselves for the next crisis or being in political allyship, yeah. but actually in a deeper way that Judaism learns about itself and changes and, and Jews learn about themselves through meaningful Encounters. exchange and interaction with non-Jews. So the short answer is there's no possible way for Jews to do anything in America without doing it in some ways in relationship to non-Jews. <laughs> that's because that's who, that's who Jews in America are, are in families with. That's who they are in neighborhoods with, households. Um, that's who they live in synagogues with. Um, so there's no way for it not for, is there's no way for any version of an American Jewish expression that's going to be in carried out by the plurality of American Jews, the majority of American Jews, that thinks of itself as happening in isolation from non-Jews. Um, the question of how to do that via the interfaith setting, I have a lot of thoughts on that from work that we've been doing with American Christians and American Muslims. I think that the most provocative version of that work that we've seen has been when we make the interfaith encounter a means of provoking difference and not homogenizing it. I think part of where the interfaith encounter winds up not actually helping all that much is when it becomes a vehicle for showing how similar we are, or as you said, when it becomes limited to political allyship. Uh, then you suppress the really interesting stuff, which is why we actually think of ourselves as different. And that becomes a tool by which it loops back around. The very act of doing Jewish in relationship to non-Jews, because you have to, those are the people you're with, actually becomes a vehicle of articulating some notion of useful difference. So I would just say I, I'm all for what you're talking about, but the harder work is to not drift towards the homogenization. Here's look all the ways that we're similar. The harder work is figuring out where there are meaningful essential differences between us that would be both useful for building real relationships, but also useful for, for crafting a deeper self-identity as a result. Let me, take, um, let me take two more, go ahead. And I was hoping you could tell me what it is, because I wrote down the beginning and then I got lost. <laughs> um, it started with how do we transform victimhood into, and then I lost it. Uh, hmm. <laughs> if you can't find it, it's okay. Yeah, I'm not sure that I have that written down. I, I think it's being recorded, oh. so there's a good chance that it was, ca it was captured there, possibly being tweeted, I don't know. Um, yeah, sorry. Thank you. You got it. Um, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Yair. Yeah, and then I'll take Vernon's question as well. Oh. Um, you outlined a set of problems, and you then gave several possible solutions to those problems. Um, you know, as a one of these sorts of people who ends up in these rooms often when people talk about here are the problems that we're dealing with as an American Jewish community and here's what maybe we should do about them. I often find that the missing piece is often the theory of change uh, because very often it's, those conversations take place in the context of say a leadership program, yeah. right? And here is, you know, I can name a left-wing foundation, a center foundation, a right-wing foundation. They've all got good young leadership programs, many of which I have, you know, one of my friends have been involved with. And we get called up by their officers and they say to us, what could we do better? And a lot of us turn to them and say, stop investing in people who would already have shown up to this program. Right? We were already going to be affiliated Jews thinking about these things. Maybe it wouldn't be as good or as deep, but we would have already ended up there. I'm a rabbi's kid. Um, but there's all of these people, right? so many Jews you know, who we meet on college campuses, who we see in other contexts, right, who no one ever reached out to them. There's no follower investment. There's only a leadership investment. Um, and I think it's something that places like Hartman think about. I've seen some Jewish foundations think about this thing. So I'm sort of curious, as opposed to the top-down solutions, right? what do you think the American Jewish community needs to do to approach these challenges that works from like a bottom-up solution and that doesn't you know, intervene late in life when people are already too far gone to reach? Well, I guess, first of all, I, I want to contest the hypothesis that the problems are generated bottom-up and that the leadership is 
working top down, most of the problems that I articulated here are actually coming top down. <laughs> uh, the for better or worse, the overwhelming majority of American Jews, overwhelming majority of American Jews, are actually not the problem. They are living perfectly happy lives doing uncomplicated Judaism. <laughs> They are, not, uh, they are not all that complicit in the shaping of what Judaism means in America because they vote with their feet through non-belonging, non-participation, broad endorsement of what Judaism means in America and so forth. Most of the problems that we're talking about are actually uh, ideological and political problems generated by an elite. Now, I, I'm basically okay with that because it, it accords with my theory of change for the Jewish people, which is ideas and leaders wind up shaping the course of Jewish history and that you actually need a relatively small number of people committed to different ideas to radically change Jewish history. I'm not convinced that the question is followership training as opposed to leadership training. I am convinced, however, that most of what passes for leadership training is followership training. <laughs> um, in, in the American Jewish community, a great deal of leadership education is um, is how do I present a non-problematic Judaism that people get excited about so that they can fill the leadership seats of people who are retiring, right? Which is a non-disruptive approach. In fact, years ago when, I, when we were starting up Harvard North America, I went to speak to a, um, a head of a federation and the per person just said to me, you know, we used to do a lot more study with our leadership on big questions and we stopped doing it. And I said, I said, why? And, and she said, well, when it made people feel good about Judaism, uh, it helped. Raised our fundraising dollars, et cetera. But when it actually did what it was supposed to do, which was get them to ask really hard questions about our priorities and what we were committed to, it was disrupting our agenda. It was like an unbelievably honest representation. And I loved that answer because it was so wonderful that the person affirmed that Torah study and investing in leadership actually works. It's just that people don't really want to do it the right way. <laughs> um, so I, again, I don't think this is about reaching the masses, so to speak. I think it is about shifting the agenda of the relatively small, pe small number of people who set the agenda for American Jewry. Uh, last one, Vernon, go ahead. Uh, part, of the, <clears throat> part of the contention of American Jewish problem is the difference between the individual and the collective, the sovereign self, et cetera, and all of that. So how does that relate, therefore, to the collective, to the sense of being part of a community, to the kihila of the Middle Ages, where American Jewry now is so diffuse, so variegated, so non-essentially congregated, congregated, and therefore moving on their own pace one by one by one? Yeah, so I, I'm not as convinced as some of the sociologists that the problem is radical individualism. I'm not. Um, the, the central drivers of the Jewish conversation in America are institutions, organizations, I hate that this is a word, influencers, um, who actually command large audiences. And many of the people who participate in such gatherings are actually seeking the affirmation of larger numbers of people. Uh, if you've been to the APAC conference, the APAC conference is amazing. It's an extraordinary experience. I recommend um, to American Jews to, to participate in it because they're not going to find any other context in American Jewish life where are that many people together for what is not officially a Jewish activity but is functionally a Jewish activity. They're never going to find that many people in one place. And I notice that people who do participate in it get very excited by the fact that it's not an idiosyncratic, individually defined agenda, but that they're actually participating in a larger collective enterprise. I think we have overplayed the notion that what, what American Jews are about is radical individualism. I think what we, are, what, we ha what we have is that people want the right to shape their own commitments, right? And they have the autonomy and the structures in which to shape their own commitments. But, like, but human beings anthropologically have not changed. Human beings anthropologically still are in search of community meaning and purpose. And when we have infrastructure that provides that to people, American Jews do participate collectively and show up. So any version of articulating a solution to the Jewish problem has to be morally, intellectually compelling enough that people will want to choose it. That's what's different than before. Previously, it might have been that these are the approaches, these are the collective instruments that people are uh, coercively required to belong to. 
The shift is any argument that we make about the enduring, vi about what we need to create as the infrastructure um, for enduring Jewish vitality is going to have to sell itself to people as something that they're going to want to participate in. But I genuinely believe that, I kind of believe in open markets. <laughs> if the American Jewish community was capable of articulating reasons to be connected to Jewish collective projects that were morally, affectively, spiritually, culturally compelling, I see no reason why, um, and it's no reason to believe that humans have anthropologically changed that much in a couple of decades, and I have no reason to believe that they can't be successful. Anyway, thank you very much.